Mickey Mantle was the kind of ball player, the kind of person that people were attracted to. And so while we grieve, we also honor Mickey as we remember his life and the special ways and memories that touched us all. One special memory that touched a nation was his poignant interview with Bob Costas. And after Bob comes and talks about his favorite Yankee, Roy Clark, Mickey's special friend, will sing at Mickey's request made some time ago. Please come, Bob. Thank you, Bobby. You know, it occurs to me as we're all sitting here thinking of Mickey, he's probably somewhere getting an earful from Casey Stengel and no doubt quite confused by now. <laughs> One of Mickey's fondest wishes was that he be remembered as a great teammate, to know that the men he played with thought well of him. Well, it was more than that. Moose and Whitey and Tony and Yogi and Bobby and Hank, what a remarkable team you were. And the stories of the visits you guys made to Mickey's bedside the last few days were heartbreakingly tender. It meant everything to Mickey, as would the presence of so many baseball figures past and present here today. I was honored to be asked to speak by the Mantle family today. I am not standing here as a broadcaster. Mel Allen is the eternal voice of the Yankees, and that would be his place. And there are others here with a longer and deeper association with Mickey than mine. But I guess I'm here not so much to speak for myself as to simply represent the millions of baseball-loving kids who grew up in the 50s and 60s and for whom Mickey Mantle was baseball. And more than that, he was a presence in our lives, a fragile hero to whom we had an em emotional attachment so strong and lasting that it defied logic. Mickey often said he didn't understand it, this enduring connection and affection. The men now in their 40s and 50s, otherwise perfectly sensible, who went dry in the mouth and stammered like schoolboys in the presence of Mickey Mantle. Maybe Mick was uncomfortable with it, not just because of his basic shyness, but because he was always too honest to regard himself as some kind of deity. But that was never really the point. In a very different time than today, the first baseball commissioner, Kennesaw Mountain Landis, said, every boy builds a shrine to some baseball hero. And before that shrine, a candle always burns. For a huge portion of my generation, Mickey Mantle was that baseball hero. And for reasons that no statistics no dry recitation of facts can possibly capture. He was the most compelling baseball hero of our lifetime. And he was our symbol of baseball at a time when the game meant something to us that perhaps it no longer does. Mickey Mantle had those dual qualities so seldom seen, exuding dynamism and excitement, but at the same time, touching your heart, flawed, wounded. We knew there was something poignant about Mickey Mantle before we knew what poignant meant. We didn't just root for him, we felt for him. Long before many of us ever cracked a serious book, we knew something about mythology as we watched Mickey Mantle run out a home run through the lengthening shadows of a late Sunday afternoon at Yankee Stadium. There was greatness in him, but vulnerability too. He was our guy. When he was hot, we felt great. When he slumped or got hurt, we sagged a bit too. We tried to crease our caps like him, kneel in an imaginary on-deck circle like him, run like him, heads down, elbows up. Billy Crystal's here today. Billy says that at his bar mitzvah, he spoke in an Oklahoma drawl. Billy's here today because he loved Mickey Mantle, and millions more who felt like him are here today in spirit as well. It's been said that the truth is never pure and rarely simple. Mickey Mantle was too humble and honest to believe that the whole truth about him could be found on a Wheaties box or a baseball card. 
but the emotional truths of childhood have a power that transcend objective fact. They stay with us through all the years, withstanding the ambivalence that so often accompanies the experiences of adults. That's why we can still recall the immediate tingle in that instant of recognition when a Mickey Mantle popped up in a pack of Topps bubblegum cards, a treasure lodged between an Eli Gerba and a Pumpsy Green. That's why we smile today, recalling those October afternoons when we'd sneak a transistor radio into school to follow Mickey and the Yankees in the World Series. Or when I think of Mr. Tomasi, a very wise sixth grade teacher who understood that the World Series was more important, at least for one day, than any school lesson could be. So he brought his black and white TV from home, plugged it in, and let us watch it right there in school through the flicker and the static. It was richer and more compelling than anything I've seen on a high-resolution big-screen TV. Of course, the bad part, Bobby, was that Koufax struck 15 of you guys out that day. <laughs> My phone's been ringing the past few weeks as Mickey fought for his life. I've heard from people I hadn't seen or talked to in years, guys I played stickball with, even some guys who took Willie's side in those endless Mantle Maze arguments. They're grown up now. They have their families. They're not even necessarily big baseball fans anymore. But they felt something hearing about Mickey, and they figured I did too. In the last year, Mickey Mantle, always so hard on himself, finally came to accept and appreciate that distinction between a role model and a hero. The first, he often was not. The second, he always will be. And in the end, people got it. And Mickey Mantle got from America something other than misplaced and mindless celebrity worship. He got something far more meaningful. He got love. Love for what he had been. Love for what he made us feel. Love for the humanity and sweetness that was always there, mixed in with the flaws and all the pain that racked his body and his soul. We wanted to tell him that it was okay, that what he had been was enough. We hoped he felt that Mutt Mantle would have understood and that Merlin and the boys loved him. And then in the end, something remarkable happened the way it does for champions. Mickey Mantle rallied. His heart took over. And he had some innings as fine as any in 1956 or with his buddy Roger in 1961. But this time, he did it in the harsh and trying summer of 95. And what he did was stunning. The sheer grace of that ninth inning, the humility, the sense of humor, the total absence of self-pity, the simple eloquence and honesty of his pleas to others to take heed of his mistakes. All of America watched in admiration. His doctors said he was, in many ways, the most remarkable patient they'd ever seen. His bravery so stark and real that even those used to seeing people in dire circumstances were moved by his example. Because of that example, organ donations are up dramatically all across America. A cautionary tale has been honestly told and perhaps will affect some lives for the better. And our last memories of Mickey Mantle are as heroic as the first. None of us, Mickey included, would want to be held to account for every moment of our lives. But how many of us can say that our best moments were as magnificent as his? This is the cartoon from this morning's Dallas Morning News. Maybe some of you saw it. It got torn a little bit on the way from the hotel to here. There's a, a figure here, St. Peter, I take it to be, with his arm around Mickey, that broad back and the number seven. He's holding his book of admissions. He says, kid, that was the most courageous ninth inning I've ever seen. 
It brings to mind a story Mickey liked to tell on himself, and maybe some of you have heard it. He pictured himself at the pearly gates, met by St. Peter, who shook his head and said, Mick, we checked the record. We know some of what went on. Sorry, we can't let you in, but before you go, God wants to know if you'd sign these six dozen baseballs. <laughs> well, there were days when Mickey Mantle was so darn good that we kids would bet that even God would want his autograph. But like the cartoon says, I don't think Mick needed to worry much about the other part. I just hope God has a place for him where he can run again, where he can play practical jokes on his teammates and smile, that boyish smile. Because God knows no one's perfect. And God knows there's something special about heroes. So long, Mick, and thanks. A moving, moving eulogy by Mickey Mantle's friend, Bob Costas. Right now, we've cut to a live picture uh, at Mickey Mantle's restaurant here on Central Park South. People have been watching the funeral there, um, also doing their part in saying goodbye to Mickey. And now, here is Roy Clark with the song that Mickey wanted to hear yesterday while I was young. As if it were a foolish game The way the evening breeze may tease A candle flame The splendid things I planned I always built to last On weak and shifting sand I lived by night And shunned the naked light of day and only now I see how the years ran away. Yesterday, when I was young, so many happy songs were waiting to be sung. So many wild pleasures lay in store for me. In so much pain, my dazzled eyes refused to see. I ran so fast the time and youth at last ran out I never stopped to think what life was all about and every conversation I can now recall concerned itself with me and nothing else at all yesterday the moon was blue and every crazy day brought something new to do I used my magic age as if it were a wand and never saw the waste and the emptiness beyond the game of a love I play with arrogance and pride and every flame I lit too quickly, quickly died. The friends I made all seemed somehow to drift away and only I am left on stage to end the play there are so many songs in me that won't be sung i feel the bitter taste of tears upon my tongue the time has come for me to pay for yesterday when i was young